Well, good evening, everybody. If you will, get your hymnals out, and we're going to start the worship service. We're going to sing page 136, You Are Washed in the Blood. to see you tonight see y'all missed my preaching so much this morning look at this sunday night crowd um, you said we thought T tim was going to be back again tonight pastor i get it i get it let me share announcements i know i keep repeating the same thing but uh, hopefully we'll say it enough it'll be locked in uh this coming saturday Who, who's going to be there can i ask you that you're going to be here saturday for mark lanier That'll make me feel better if I see two or three hands at least. So, so thank you. The rest of you, you still have time to decide that you're going to be here Saturday. I hope you'll come, and I hope you'll bring somebody, and that it'll be a good time in the Lord. That's how it's going to go, and I'm excited about it. Um, Six o'clock, yeah, I believe that's right. I don't have my bulletin in front of me now, but I'm pretty sure it was six o'clock. Um, then the 11th, next Sunday at five is there family back to school bash and that'll be a great time together too so be aware of that and i emphasize again the spark conference uh, there's something for everybody Every, everybody here serving in some ministry in some role and uh, they have we'll begin with a worship service uh saturday morning and and it's a big name speaker that uh, you'll really be blessed by and then two um, breakout sessions you pick which ones you want to go to they're um class in every different um, approach and type and style of ministry. They even have security classes. So we got stuff for security team, Sunday school teachers, discipleship training, children's workers, preschool workers, music classes. You do. I agree with that. <laughs> but it'll be great. We'll, we'll take the van if we have people um, wanting to do that, and we'll have a good time together. And Maybe get some lunch afterwards, too. So that's the 24th. Get that on your calendar. I want to read uh, a passage to you from Mark chapter 7. Um, this is one of Jesus' encounters with the scribes and Pharisees. 
uh, and they saw the apostles, the scribes and Pharisees saw the apostles eating with unclean hands, which it means you are defiled in their mind. But notice, these are rules they made up. So the Pharisees and the teachers asked Jesus, Mark chapter 7, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? The tradition of the elders means they made these rules up. It's not in God's law. They extended the law and built a whole uh, chain of rules and regulations around the law to make sure you, you were uh, not going to ever get close to violating the law. And Jesus said, um, notice this answer. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You make up your rules and then you elevate them uh, and worship them, basically. I wonder uh, if those in, in our lives, we make up a rule that we think has to be imposed and probably didn't come from the Lord. But somehow we're going to judge people by that rule. That's something we need to be very careful of. And Jesus gave the sternest rebuke. These are the religious leaders. He defined them as hypocrites. And he said, you're just forcing people into categories and judging people for false reasons. Let's pray together and make sure that our lives are free of that. Father, we do ask that you would be with us here tonight. We love to come together. We are the family of God known as Baptist Church. Thank you for opportunity to serve. Thank you for the, the joy of this place family that you're working to build and I pray Lord that you would just establish within us the right kind of commitment the right kind of faithfulness and the right kind of desire to serve you with everything we've got Lord we want to see you make this church everything that it can be and we know that is so much more than it is because you you have big goals big plans for the future of every church so just help us to be on board and be motivated and committed to that give us a heart that prays for you to work in your church. And Lord, out of that kind of heart, we ask that you would bless this time we have here together tonight. That you would speak to us. You would empower us. You would lead and grow us just like we need to be. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Judge Tracy. Uh, if you will, get your hymnals out. Turn to page 161. Crown him with many crowns. You can stand. This will be our offertory hymn, 426, Victory in Jesus. This is Robert's favorite one.
gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your house. Lord, we thank you for your goodness that you show us each and every day in salvation in Jesus, in whose name I pray. I pray you be with Brother Trace as he brings word. Be with those that are sick and hurting, Lord. We lift them up for comfort and healing where you will. Be with those who believe the lost loved ones, Lord. We pray for this nation that it will truly come back to you. Lord, we pray for this offering that is further work your works and glorify your name. And we just thank you for all things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Kenneth. That's our backup pianist. <laughs> Revelation chapter 19. If you'll turn in your Bible, uh, in the minds of many people, this should be the highlight of the book, or maybe one of a bunch of highlights. Uh, there are several high points that we come to throughout this uh, book of Revelation that we're supposed to be very excited about. In fact, every time hear the, the hallelujah and the holy, holy, holy break out in the book of Revelation, somebody's worshiping, and that ought to clue us in. Maybe we ought to be worshiping also. And so the first part of this whole chapter is the wedding supper of the Lamb, and there's lots of hosannas and hallelujahs in those first ten verses. That's what we looked at last time. And when we get to verse 11, we see why those hosannas and hallelujahs are happening. So we've covered much of the details, actually, um, to point us to this final battle that takes place at the end of chapter 19. This is the end of the end of the end. When the battle's over, it's all over. And all we see left is the judgment, the new heavens, the new earth, the, the thousand-year millennium. Uh, and then uh, um, who goes where, basically, is uh, what comes after this. But in chapter 19, it is the conclusion of the matter as far as if you had any kind of doubt or confusion or you wonder how this is all going to turn out or what's it going to mean or who wins the fight or what's in it for me, any kind of thought like that, when you get to the end of chapter 19, you go, oh, yeah, should have known. I should have known who was going to win this fight. So we've uh, hit some of the references or the hints that point us to this. Back in chapter 14, you see um, comments made there. Let's uh, look at a few verses in chapter 14. Verse 17, another angel came out of the temple in heaven. He too had a sharp sickle and still another angel who had charge of the fire, came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. Take your sharp sickle, gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. And they were trampled in the winepress outside the city. The blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles, uh, four feet or so for 1,600 stadia. And you'll remember when we uh, studied that passage, four feet for 200 miles. That's pretty much the north-south distance of the land of Israel. So that much blood is going to flow out of this battle. And chapter 14 is telling us, this is the Lord harvesting in his wrath. They reap of the earth and all of those gathered to fight against him. They are judged and harvested. And uh, it's like the trampling out of the grapes of wrath. And the song that you're familiar with, the one that was uh, sung in the Civil War and is still in our hymnal, that's the passage where that song 
comes from. Then in Revelation 16, it gives us more preparatory detail about the battle. The chapter begins with the seventh with the seven bowls of judgment that's the final outpouring of the wrath of god the sixth bowl is the outpouring on the river euphrates that dries up the river uh, which you know is in iran iraq turkey through that area north of israel um, and it is a um, well-defined geographic line um, where the enemies of israel will um, bivouac they will prepare they will have their camps and bases and the armies will set up and be ready and so the sixth bowl of wrath god dries up the river to invite them to come to to their desire they think they're going for one reason god instead says okay it's time i'll play along for a, for a while to get you to the place i intend you to be we're also told there that the demonic um uh, instigators they are dispatched from satan and they go to these kings and uh, and urge them bring your armies get things ready it's time to go to war and so all of those kings have sold their souls to the devil and they are waiting for this command they've already got everything lined up and so they move out in chapter 16 16 says then they gathered the kings together to the place that in hebrew is called armageddon you know that word it's one of the most well recognized words in christian circles there are lots of books with that word as part of the title in the book and the chapter ends chapter 16 by pronouncing the doom and the destruction that is to come it's very similar in fashion to jesus's words um, when phase one of his ministry was completed on the cross and now we come to the end of phase two with that statement, it is done. That is the last in chapter 16. That is what Jesus said on the cross. We have finished this work. And now that statement is voiced again to declare uh, everything is accomplished. The end has arrived. Uh, but even with all this information, all of this assurance from God uh, that the end is here, uh, we are now told in chapter 19 the specifics of what that is going to look like uh, what takes place how this happens but strangely we're not told nearly as many uh, specifics as we wish um, this is where we'd like to see the movie made you know we want to see the the forces from russia coming over there and the forces from china coming over there i'm supplying the countries they don't say that in scripture but that's generally what's thought to be the forces from turkey coming from over there and the um, islamic forces coming from that direction and who comes first and we want to read all the strategy and the play out of the battle but we're not told any of that None of the details come in chapter 19. Instead, we're given what we need to know and what we need to understand about the battle. And if you know Jesus really well and you know his word really well, you probably understand why we're told what we're told the way we are told. Let's uh, pick up in verse 11 of chapter 19. I, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. Now we know who this is. The name is not given beyond faithful and true. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire. On his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. Quotation marks from Psalm chapter 2. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty, which is supposed to put your mind back into chapter 16 where the sickle is 
um, cast and the enemies of God are harvested in the grapes of that harvest, the fruit of that harvest are thrown into the wine press and they are trampled. And so we're told again, the wine press of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In those five verses, there are four references to different names for Jesus. Different names, very significant in their meaning and the point that's being made. And then uh, verse 17, I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried out in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, come gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty of horses and their riders and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured. Uh, that means the battle's already over. Okay, you see verse 19. I saw the array of Satan and his forces, 17 and 18. I see um, the Lord himself in uh, verse 19 and 20. And then uh, verse 20 says they were captured. The battle takes place in between those verses. That, that's the significance of the whole chapter. The battle happens without really any great description of what it was that happened. So the beast was captured. The false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf uh, was captured. And with these signs, he has deluded those who received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. And all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. End of the battle. End of the battle. This is the final, the end, the conclusion of the matter. And you've been wondering why evil has its day. You've been wondering why the darkness seems to be on the march so powerfully in these days in our life and why nothing that has worked and has been honored in America is really sought after or work, working now anymore. Well, that's because evil does have its day. And God has designed that Satan will rise up. He will draw uh, all of the forces of the world under his command to his banner for his intended purpose, his foolish intended purpose to stand against the Lord and somehow um, bring about one final blow to end the Lord. You and I know how to read this passage, and we don't really even need to be told who wins, how he won, what it is that happened in any kind of detail. And that's why we're not given any detail. So throughout the book of Revelation, we've seen a great deal of rebellion. We've seen hatred upon the earth, all of that aimed at God. We've waded through the calamity and the destruction, all the while noticing the unrepentant hearts of all of these people again and again. God gave them a chance to repent. They were called to repent. The two witnesses preached the gospel for two years and they were given the chance to repent. At one point, the angel finally writes it in the sky. Have you ever had a friend who said, well, if God would just write it in the sky, then I would believe. Well, that's actually going to happen. And guess what? They are still not going to believe. So we've seen all of that. We've seen every chance for repentance. It's been 15 or so chapters of how bad things are going to get and how resistant people will be to the truth. You wonder why people can't get it now. Well, that pretty much illustrates it, right? They are in love with this world and sold out for their God, little g God, who is Satan himself. It's why we are told, I mentioned this last week as well, why every idol, every philosophy that rejects God, every religion, false religion in this world, every pursuit that man is after for his eternal value that turns its back on God, all of that points back to Satan. Every single thing. Satan uh, sends 
his little minions and he allows them to wear whatever robe they want and put whatever crown on their head and do whatever hand signals and put whatever behind them that they say represents whatever they believe and you don't have to worry about whatever it is or what the details are. All you need to know is that's the devil. That is Satan, and Satan is drawing everything together, and God keeps it going. Why? Because he is a God seeking repentance, and he gives them a chance, just like he gave you and me and you a chance to hear the gospel and be changed by it and surrender our lives to them. them. There will be plenty of people that do that, but the overwhelming majority turn their back. They, they close their eyes and their ears and don't want anything God has to offer them. And you, you see that. You see the crazy things people say on Facebook or on, on X Twitter and wonder how people can think that way and feel that way and have those ideas. Well, why? Because they're all about this kingdom and all the king, the master of this kingdom. So we've seen all of this for 15 chapters, how bad things are and how bad things are going to get and how resistant people are. Uh, Our glimpses of heaven during this time have centered mostly on the response of the masses to the events being described. Lots of um, worship uh, expressions. Lots of times we see the crowd who loves the Lord and believes in the Lord declaring their praise and yet their how long? How much longer? What are we waiting on here? Um, We've seen that as a point of delay too as Satan's power seems to grow and uh, Christians and martyrs become anxious waiting for when this is going to happen. Uh, But what we can say now is it's going to happen. We are always marching toward this end point in Revelation 19. We see this final action and we understand heaven's hero is visible He is charging fast toward the enemy. What we're reading about is Christ's second coming. Now I want you to think with me just a little bit. Um, This is where Christ comes back. And we have to process and understand um, how we interpret the things in Scripture that address the Lord's return. Because there is some debate about exactly how the rapture fits into the second coming and what, what is the timeline for all of that. And let me, I've said this before, I, I don't want anybody, you know, to think less of me or not be my friend. Uh, but my job is to be very clear with you about the Scripture. The Bible does not tell us when the rapture happens. Okay, I'm being totally honest with you, even though you hear plenty of sermons where they say they know with certainty where the rapture happens. We cannot know with certainty because the scripture does not declare with any certainty when it happens. That's the best I can give you. Now, there, there are theories and interpretations, and quite honestly, I lean one way sometimes, and I lean the other way sometimes, because there's, there's a great weight of truth and clear verses on both sides. So I get the idea that he doesn't really want us to know exactly when the rapture is going to happen. But when we talk about the second coming that is prophesied in the Old Testament, the wrath of God and the ultimate and final return of Christ and everything is finished. That's this in chapter 19 in the book of Revelation. So I would like to, you know, just kind of work through some of this and pick up on uh, some of the pieces to to give some thought to it and let you think a little more. Um, virtually all Bible scholars will tell you what I've just said as far as how we label chapter 19. It is the second coming, the second coming. And every commentary you read um, will say that. And they don't often uh, bring in the rapture and try to tell you their case for where the rapture is actually going to fit with the second coming. Um, But the the one challenge I know is there are lots of Baptists who believe the rapture is the second coming. 
So I would point out to you, if the rapture is the second coming, that's chapter 19 in the book of Revelation. That would make you a post-trib rapture believer. So you got to at least not say the rapture is the second coming if you believe the rapture is going to happen earlier. I'm seeing confused looks. Are y'all with me? Everything okay? You following me? I'm trying to be as, as clear and plain in what I'm saying. Julie tells me sometimes the more plain I try to be, the more confusing I am. So if I'm confusing you, I'm sorry for that. Um, typically, we Southern Baptists are pre-trib rapture believers, uh, but we need to know why we believe that if that's what we believe and how we can reinforce that and declare it. Um, the other major passage about the rapture is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and it says in verse 16 and 17, the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. Now, there are many people who, when they believe the rapture uh, as separate from this, they believe the rapture is kind of a secret coming. But the rapture is described as loud command, trumpet being played, and, and which doesn't sound secret to me. Now, it's possible only Christians will hear that. I, I understand that, that, and that's fine with me. I'm certainly not arguing against it. Um, again, we just need to know what we're talking about when we talk about it. Is that, that okay for me to say? We need to understand what the Word says, not just what brother so-and-so told me or somebody over here said. And they say with such fiery passion. I've heard some preach one way or the other and, and say things like, you know, if you believe in the Lord, then you have to believe the way I'm telling you. Well, no, I believe the way the Bible says it. And if what you're telling me does not jive with what the Bible says, I'm, I'm not going your way. I'm going the way of Scripture. And if the Scripture is vague, that is intentional, and I can accept that too and be okay with that whole issue. And so the, the next verse in 1 Thessalonians 4, After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and then we will be with the Lord forever. Uh, so, um, some would say there are two parts to the second coming. If you have a pre-trib rapture, they call that first a second coming part one, and then Revelation 19, second coming part two. Or they try and work it out by saying, well, the first time Jesus doesn't come down to the earth. It says there that they will meet him in the air. The idea is we are caught up with him. That's the exact language in the King James. So we meet him in the air, and that's not really a second coming. So that's okay if that's how somebody wants to interpret it. I, I understand it, but I don't like to play word games with Scripture either. You know, if we try to, to plug in nuances of, of how we see it and how we think and what our meaning is, you do understand those kinds of uh, issues and interpretations, they ebb and flow from generation to generation to generation. Well, the Bible does not ebb and flow from one generation to the next. So we, we've got to be able to say, what does it say literally? How do I understand that in the clearest and the simplest fashion? So 1 Thessalonians, we're caught up. We meet him in the air. That, that passage says no timeline. We don't know when exactly. And nowhere else does it say that the rapture definitively will happen before the tribulation. There are um, references that are interpreted to, to weigh this direction or to weigh that direction. I'm not going to take the time to go through all of those because we don't have that kind of time anyway. And y'all have all got your minds made up anyway, too. So I'm not trying to change any minds. Uh, I've even heard some preachers try so hard to defend it, um, you know, by, by getting a little, a little too much into opinion. And they'll say things so strongly when it's clear they're expressing their opinion. Um, I, I don't want to hear that from a preacher. You know, if you have an opinion, great. Tell me your opinion, but don't tell me why your opinion is absolutely right and everybody else is wrong. Uh, if it's your opinion, we don't know if you're absolutely right or not. You know why? Because only Jesus and the Word of God are absolutely right. 
So that, that's all I can take, and that's the best I can do. And over and over again, the New Testament talks about the mystery of the gospel and the fact that there's a whole lot more to God and Jesus uh, than we know or that we're ever really going to be able to fully grasp. And so we're supposed to be able to say, it's okay, I know he's coming back. I know he's taking me home. I know he's winning the fight, and everything is going to be okay. So I just want to make it very plain and clear. Uh, whatever you believe about the second coming, the second coming is Revelation 19. This is that event as it's described in the Bible and as it's referenced in every prophecy in the Old Testament about the great and terrible day of the Lord, which is a phrase in various um, adjectives, but a phrase that is used over and over again in the Old Testament to talk about what this day is going to be. So understanding that then, it raises more issues that we really need to understand, particularly compared the first coming with the second coming. And I believe we really can benefit by seeing um, the mission of Christ in his first coming as that really contrasts better than compares to his mission in the second coming. Think about some of these things. The first coming was as a helpless baby. The second coming will be as a conquering warrior. The first time Christ came in calmness and humility. The second time he comes in fury and power. The first time he came as a suffering Messiah. The second time he will return as a glorious king. First, he came to die. Second, he comes to reign. In his first coming, he earned our salvation. The next time he comes, he finishes our salvation. He brings everything to its right conclusion. When he came the first time, it was hidden. Revelation 19 makes it clear that when he comes the second time, it'll be visually overpowering. Even you and I behind him are going to be stunned by what we see in this event. It will be visually startling, shocking, amazing. And if Jesus lives in your heart, well, let me say it this way. Either way, you're probably going to be there. Satan's got his forces arrayed. If he can think of some way to raise the dead and get them standing on the battlefield, he'll do that too. Maybe the Lord would even intend that just so every living person ever could see the real reality of who he is and what he is about. Um, by the way, uh, again, 1 Thessalonians 4, when it talks about the rapture, it says a shout and a loud trumpet call. It's not going to be a hidden rapture when it finally does happen. Uh, and in Revelation 19, the language is very similar. He's coming as this warrior, and the, the sounds, the sights, the visual, visuals will be overcoming. Still with our list, the first time he came as Savior. The second time he comes as judge. The first time he came riding on a donkey, humble, meek, mild the second time he comes riding on a stallion coming for warfare and to conquer the first time he came it was to bring peace to our hearts now you might think the second time he's coming to bring war but in fact he's coming to establish peace in all of his creation peace in the world the warfare has come for all of human existence since genesis 3 because mankind is turning its back on its creator every chance that it gets sin brings warfare and horror and fighting and belligerence and bad attitudes and negativity and hate and destruction sin is what's going on in ukraine and russia sin is what's going on in israel and all the little dots of the terrorist groups in Iran surrounding Israel. It's all because of the sin that exists in our world. So he came first to bring peace, peace to our hearts. The second time, he's coming to bring peace to the whole earth. The first time, the coming of uh, the government was in the hands of men. And the second time, he is coming to become the government. That is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. And the government will be on his shoulders. Isaiah prophesies about him as a baby first. 
first coming and as this conquering warrior second coming. He does not hold the government yet, but he will be the government. And at this point, when Jesus is on the throne or when he speaks, you will bow the knee and say, yes, Lord. And you will say it willingly and joyfully because you know he is the one in charge. The first coming was in veiled glory. It was still in glory, but veiled glory. The second time he comes, his glory is exploding on the scene, bursting forth like nothing any of us have ever experienced. And I wonder sometimes if it's not just going to be so much of heaven coming down into the presence of the created order that it might be more than any created being in heaven themselves have ever seen or really understood Now this great outpouring, this ultimate final victory, everything in the Bible is to get us to Revelation 19. So Revelation 19 is supposed to be, wow, can you see it? Can you believe it? Can you understand it? What in the world? So let's talk a little bit about our descriptions of the Lord, verses 11 through 16. This is probably going to be a two-parter. Even as I was uh, finishing up my notes, I thought, there's a whole lot more I want to say about this than what I I got here. So we'll we'll probably do this some more next time. But we can get through the first uh, 16, 11 through 16, talk about um, how the Lord is described. Uh, First, it says he is on a white horse. The white horse symbolically demonstrates the spotless, unblemished nature of Christ. It is Christ in his purity and his perfection. As well, um, the imagery from the first century would be the Roman general in the triumphal parade. When there's a Roman victory and the army comes back to Rome, they have a parade. And it's a massive spectacle, and the general rides in first, and he's on the most glorious white horse you can imagine. And all the vanquished are behind him, shackled and kind of dragging themselves in. And so any first century reader, John wrote this about 90, 95 AD, they would get it exactly. The rider on the white horse is the victor of the battle, and Christ is the one riding. Then he is named Faithful and True, which is a reminder to us that he will be the perfect leader. He will be the perfect leader. We hear people all the time talking about the condition of our country and the coming election. I hope I don't talk about it too much, um, but I I know and feel just like you do uh, some of the challenges, some of the the shock, um, some of the just the consternation that we feel over what's going on in our country and what we see in front of us. I think we're in a mess. I'm not sure that anybody that's identified as a leader has any capacity to fix the problems that we have as a country. I know who I'm going to vote for, and I know who I'm going to vote against, and you know who that is. I don't have to pronounce it to you, um, but I still do not have tremendous confidence that who I'm voting for is going to, you know, ride forth victorious and we're going to see things return to to a better life and a better world in America the way it used to be. I also understand um, that our problems are much more spiritual problems than they are material problems. Our problems as a nation stem from people turning their back on the Lord and embracing and celebrating every evil that they can. And that celebrating part has happened in the last 10 or so years. I mean, visible, every media outlet, every voice on all the social media stuff. If you come out on any kind of platform and say what you believe about the Bible, they will cut you down in a second. And I don't mean, you know, when I was a kid, to cut you down was to, you know, say some silly word and make fun of you. Yeah, I cut you down. I mean, cut you down in in whatever force and power they can bring against you. They will dox you. They will out you. They will fire you. They will wreck your life. They will come after your children. They will pick it in front of your house or whatever they can figure out to do. If you try to even speak for what is right and good and true, that is the condition of the world in which we live in, our country, and it is a spiritual issue. I don't see either one of those trying to be our president very spiritual. 
Is it okay for me to say that? You, you're not going to get your dander up in, in that sense, uh, I know. Here we see the name of our Savior. He is faithful and true. If you really want to think about what, what do I need to know about Jesus and all of the ways he's categorized, defined, all of the different uh, expressions of his character, this is a pretty powerful term, isn't it? He is faithful. He's got you. He's sticking with you. He's going to do whatever he says he's going to do. That means you can trust every promise in his word. And he is true. That means you don't have to believe any of the junk in the world. You don't have to wonder if the Bible means what it says or um, does this apply to me or does this matter? I saw one of those ridiculous women on The View this past week talking about we Christians and how we take the Bible and how ridiculous it is that we take the Bible literally. And don't they know the Bible wasn't meant to be taken literally? And I'm going, what? Who made you the grand poobah of how the Bible is interpreted? You know, it's like God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and this nutcase woman, you know, and the fourth person up there in the Trinity. Where did you get the special message for how we're supposed to interpret the Bible? Clearly, the Holy Spirit doesn't live in your heart, so I'm not listening to anything you've got to say. That's what this is all about, though is this kind of attack. We need a leader who is faithful and true. The Lord is consistent. He is our only hope. That's what that title means to me. And then he judges with justice, we're told, which means he will be fair, but he will be precise. Nobody, our speaker told us this morning, is getting away with nothing. Sin has a price. Either the blood of Jesus will cover the price of your sin or your own blood will cover that price. And that day is coming in Revelation 19. That day has arrived. He will judge with justice. And then his eyes are like fire, uh, which means nothing will escape his penetrating view. This is the same description way back in chapter 4, chapter 5, where Jesus is described there. Uh, and he gets the same um, expression. His eyes are like blazing coals of fire. He sees you is what that means. He sees into you. He knows what you're about. And when it comes to chapter 19, there's nowhere for them to hide. Nobody's getting away with it and finding a, a hidey hole and sneaking off when the destruction begins. It says he wears many crowns. Uh, I believe this is uh, in direct opposition to the way the Antichrist is described and Satan. There's um, several passages that talk about the crowns, the beast wearing the seven crowns or the ten crowns. Um, that might sound like a lot, but Jesus has many crowns. We, we don't even need to compare. It's not ten versus twelve. It's limited crowns. It's every crown. That's the idea. He wears many crowns because he is king of kings and lord of lords over everything. He is given a name which no one knows. There's no way to guess or speculate what this name would be. Some commentators try to do it. They're just wasting their time. It says a name that no one knows, and that means no one knows. And that's uh, intentional, uh, and we can just accept it. The point is... That Jesus' majesty, his authority is beyond the ability of Tracy Ivester to fully grasp it. I don't have to ever have any doubt or fear that he knows what he's doing and he can pull it off. He's got every single ability. I look at things and I see uh, insurmountable um, object, objectives. I see things that I cannot deal with, problems that I cannot make go away, sorrows that I don't know how I'm ever going to have hope again through this or that. And what I need to know is the Lord can do anything. And every promise will be fulfilled because of that. Then it is a robe dipped in blood. You remember, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So blood is a huge part of this. Chapter 16, four feet deep, 200 miles of blood. The point is being made that the Lord is exacting the price for the sins 
of humanity. His robe is dipped in blood. His name is the Word of God. This is the third name given in the passage. And this is a clear distinction, I think, that you've heard many times. Uh, and it's easy to say he, his name is the Word of God. Well, of course it is. Jesus is the living Word. John began his gospel that way, right? In the beginning was the Word, capital W. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We have beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father. The Son is the living word. So the Bible then becomes the clearest expression of the nature and the character of Jesus. His name is the word of God. In, verse, in chapter 19 of Revelation then, he comes as the agent of completion. Isn't it interesting that the word declares what's going to happen to Satan and his forces, and the word is what actually fulfills that promise. The word concludes that event. In uh, Matthew 24, verses 4 and 5, Jesus said, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. But you and I, we do not have to wonder when we hear the word if this is the Christ. Because the false Christ will not be speaking the word of God. He'll be distorting, twisting, making up, tearing out pages and passages and denying and constructing a whole new thing. That's what every religion has done. We don't need to be confused. If the Lord comes, we will know who he is. He shows up and there's no mistaking who he is. I so badly want to get to the rest of this, but we need to, we need to cut this off or we'll be here another hour. Uh, the excitement is yet to come. This is the interlude, and I can just tell you, come back next time because it's going to get really, really good. Okay? You got it? I want you to feel it, not just, well, good message, Pastor. Like, wow, this is the thing. This is the thing. And you ought to be in your mind saying, praise God. You ought to be able to say by the end of this ver book, like John says, even so, Come, Lord Jesus. I know all of this is going to happen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Hasten your coming. I know this great battle will take place. I know there's going to be blood. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. This is the final fulfillment of everything that you and I hope for. Let your hope soar let your excitement build let your enthusiasm be present it really ought to change the way you look at every single problem in your life i'm just passing through someday that problem's gone it'll be over it won't matter and whatever the size of the problem will be balanced out by the size of the glory of god in my life that's what he's promised to do Revelation, uh, Romans 8, you can find it there. Let's pray together and you uh, focus and assure yourself with this. Father, we love you. We give you praise. We are delighted that you have saved us. We thank you for what you do in our lives every day. And we thank you for the certainty of these coming events. It looks like they're coming soon, Lord, but we don't know. Yet still we would say we can't wait to see you face to face. If it's our home going or if we meet you in the air or however it's going to time itself out for each one of us, we can't wait. You are everything to us. And I just pray that you fill our hearts with a joy and a delight and a peace. I ask it in Jesus' name. I want you to leave your heads bowed and eyes closed. I want you to just tell the Lord thank you. Tell him you... You can't wait. You long to see him. You rejoice in the certainty of his word. Maybe he's talking to you about somebody you know that's, that's not on board, that doesn't believe. Or even in believing doesn't seem to be very faithful for their love for Jesus. And the Lord would be calling you to speak to them, to love them more, and give them a stronger testimony, to be praying more energetically for their salvation. They need to be on the team. They need to have the promise that you and I have. You call out for them.
Amen. Let's pray together. Ben Huff, would you close us in prayer tonight?